mic'd up with Mikey Matuk. Got the boys in. I got Lloyd. We got J Mitch. We got Jackie Boy. He tried to jump up, and he might have knocked it in. Good timing. Let's go. What a start to the Monday. Oh, no. <laughs> I mean, I'm from Lafayette. My boys are coming in. Oh, God. Oh, God. So I'm, me and Joe on the ground, I got Joe in the headlock. And he's sitting there, <laughs> he's punching me in the stomach, like, punching me, punching me, punching me. Here, if there's everyone sitting around, who here thinks Ochenko can practice today after having five full beers? And he goes, Chad Jones, right? Chad Jones, <laughs> six for, minutes. For seven minutes, right? Ah! Chad's like, no, man, I, I don't think Ochenko can practice today. And I was like, I look back, I'm like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> I saw you there. You're more fucked up than me. Being on the spirit plane has some issues, I think. She was sleep, sleep farting. You heard her or you just thought it was her? I, s I sat right next to her and I smelled her. Whoa. What was that? Good show. Ah! <laughs> 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 that was a good Do you go to spring training? Are you gonna bring your chinchilla and your turtle? <laughs> My dad tell you about it. <laughs> <laughs> the SEC is God. They hate fat people. <laughs> I mean, I get crushed for that. You know what I mean? It's like, come on, man. Hey, it, it, just the south, bro. You got a bunch of food down here. Like they, they should. Oh, <laughs> Players, look at. Lloyd. <laughs> you know what, Lloyd? <laughs> You're looking for a recruiting coordinator, Coach. I'm here. <laughs> He's like, I'll piss my pants right now. No, no way. No way. <laughs> He's wearing gray pants, long gray pants. He goes, I'll piss my pants right now. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to Miked Up. Today is Monday, October 16th. Uh, we have a big show for you today. A lot of LSU conversations. We're going to skip right on over from the New Orleans Saints because they stink on offense. They have not been <laughs> they just good. just know how to let you down. <laughs> it, I mean, it is not good. I don't know what's going on. They have too much talent to be good. We're not going to get into that. We'll talk about that later on in the week. Uh, we are excited to talk LSU football because they showed us a whole hell of a lot. Uh, a lot of things that we've been asking to see throughout the course of the year. You saw some progress on the defense. Now, obviously, people may say, oh, well, Auburn's defense isn't, I mean, offense isn't great. No, true. LSU secondary is also not great. It doesn't matter how good or how bad you are, you still have to tackle. We did not tackle well against Grambling State. We didn't tackle against some of these lesser teams that we have played throughout the course of the year. Auburn is a team that makes you tackle them, and I think that we did that really well. I think that was 
one of the reasons why the defense performed a lot better, the defensive line performed a lot better. I think Harold Perkins is getting a lot more comfortable in his role because he, boy, can you imagine being, I mean, you're a receiver. Can you imagine being the inside guy on a swing pass and you having to try to block him coming on a straight line, knowing exactly what's happening? You do, you do realize like half the time that happens too. It's when I line up, tell him I'm on the ball, off the ball, and I look back inside, it's usually some eye contact that's like, uh-huh. yeah, dog, it's me and yeah. you right now. Yeah, you that, just, you and you just know, he, he knows and you know, you're like, it's either me or you. I don't know how it's gonna happen. And usually it's a nickel <laughs> and you have like, oh, I have a shot. It's not a nickel. That's a speeding bullet. It's not a nickel. <laughs> um, it is Monday, which means that it's usually uh, our education from Gord, the Gordon Law Firm, you know, get Gordon. Keith Ricardo is usually in studio with his helmet on, explaining, uh, talking about his, what he saw in the game from a fan's perspective, but also giving us some education in the law. Uh, He is not here today. They are skipping today because he is in South Dakota Mm. hunting with the man himself. So I guess that is an excuse. That's fine with that. You know, if you have (laughs) have something that you need help with and you want to call, you still can call 888-888. That was enough. Uh, there's, Seven, other, eight. there's always, there's always, there's all other lawyers in the in the office that can help you. Uh, but as we announced last week, it is Moth, Moffitt Method Mondays. Oh, Tommy up. Moffitt right, has go. agreed to come on our show every Monday for a few minutes, 20, 30, 40 hour, whoever hour? Hour, no, who knows? You know, uh, he is in this Monday. We are going to talk about the game a little bit, talk about football in general, talk about really just. Anything that we want to talk about, the SEC, I feel like, is up for grabs, right? I mean, you have Alabama won a nail-biter. Like, I think Alabama's back in that stage of, hey, we're still good, but we're going to win ugly. I think they, they feel like they, you know, they were when they had um, Coker, right? Was it Coker? Jake the, Coker, the best, Jake Coker, best insurance had, uh, salesman Sims. of all time. You had Blake Sims before him. I think they're going to lean on the physicality. They're going to lean on the defense. I don't know if their defense is as good as those. Actually, I know. Their defense this year is not as good as those defenses, but they seem beatable. They seem vulnerable. That's scary also because anytime you think that, they come back and they show you that they're not. Uh, obviously, Georgia, um, they're going through some things. We don't play them unless they get to the SC championship game. You got to play Florida. Florida's played well. Graham Mertz, three better. for 400. They're back, you think? They're getting better. They're getting better. I mean, Graham Mertz, the guy they brought in, the veteran guy who they thought could run this offense, finally starting to feel comfortable. They're starting to put up some points. That game looks like it's going to be a lot bigger game in, in uh, November than we thought it was going to be. Uh, but Homecoming. It is homecoming. That's, as, yeah, that's homecoming. I don't think that really matters to, to players. No, I'm saying okay. for, for <laughs> Sweet Billy. Oh, no. Sweet Homecoming from Billy. Well, sort of. Well, yeah, Louisiana. He's not really from here. But. You're going to get a lot of the, your fam, a lot of UL contingency, I'm sure, will come no down doubt. in Florida Blue. No doubt. No doubt. As they're keeping we, score for sure. Yeah. Oh, my for God. Sure. It's one as, nothing. They're keeping score. As we speak right now, I wish I knew the score, but uh, the Rangers Let were up 5-3 in the do top a little of production. the seventh to go up two games to nothing against the Astros. Uh, baseball is still, still going on, believe it or not. They're right in the thick of it. The ALCS right now. The NLCS starts today. starts tonight with the Diamondbacks playing the Phillies. I've told you I'm rooting for the Phillies. I hope it's going to be Rangers Phillies um, in the World Series. I would love to go to a game in Philly. Oof. That would five, be amazing. Five three Rangers, bottom of the eighth. Five three Rangers, bottom of the eighth. They need to get three more, six more outs to close out this you know two nothing lead. So a lot of stuff going on. A lot of things to talk about. Most importantly, the most important thing to talk about right now is LSU football. And Coach Tommy Moffitt is in studio. I appreciate you. Thank you. Coming back in. Welcome back. To the show, uh, we are excited. How did I got to speak to your wife this weekend? We had a nice conversation. Tailgate. Purple helmet. Yeah, she. Yeah, the purple helmet. That's a great tailgate your son puts on. Yeah. He does a good job. Yeah. Yeah, he, he uh, cooked. What did he cook? Some pasta laya was good. Go to. Yeah, it's yeah. It's, 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 <laughs> <go-to>. <laughs> it's a crowd. Sounds favorite. like you've been trying to get him to branch <laughs> out from it. Yeah. yeah. It's a. <laughs> oh no! I tell you what. Um, so he makes an alligator sauce pecan. He made that chicken Ooh. and alligator sauce pecan is off the chain. Did you teach him how to cook? No. He learned that just from <laughs> being in Louisiana? Yeah. Um, you know, when he was at Eunice, they have a Cajun Life Festival. Oh, wow. It's a big week-long affair. And so Clay would go there and go from booth to booth watching the old Cajun man cook. And that's where he learned to cook. That and... 
you know, Jill's dad was a great cook. Uh, yeah. He just, he loves it. Yeah, I've, I've had some yeah. of his cooking. It's very good. Nice. It's, yeah. It's nice. I'm missing, um, I haven't had it yet. I got I got Oh, right, he can stir it up. Yeah, he's, See, okay. he, he knows what he's doing. Yeah, he, he he's chef in the up. kitchen, huh? Um, big weekend for the boys. Right, yeah. we talked about it off air a little bit. We talked about it last week. What do we want to see? Um, you know, we talked about this game being very weird. We pulled up scores from the past years, and we have not seen this type of game in a while. In a long, long time. It's been a while. Right? The overhead. I was the last person in my suite. My suite. Oh, in the suite. Yeah. Not my suite. <laughs> wow, what in a guy. Suite, wow. It was me and two Sweet. other guys. And we sure, his business hitting right. <laughs> we all three. Must be Bet nice. the over. So everybody had left because the game was yeah. out of hand. And I'm sitting there and I'm waiting. And I'm like, they lined up in that weird funky uh, shotgun formation. And I'm like, oh, my God, they're going to kneel this thing out. And I'm not going to hit the over. And they turned around handed it off to, uh, was, it, uh, Josh, uh, was it Josh Williams or John Emery who scored the last touchdown? Josh Williams. Josh Williams, Josh Williams yeah. scored the touchdown, gets the over. We got excited. Then we all got to leave. 48-18. And honestly, I don't even think it was that close. Right, they scored. You know, Auburn scored a, a touchdown kind of late in the game, uh, went for went uh, for the two point conversion. Then LSU scored, I think, two more touchdowns to kind of go ahead. Defense looked a lot better. Um, a lot better. Big before we go Jenkins. around, coach, I want to hear your your pers- perspective of it. You know, we talked about yeah. you wanted to see the defensive line show a little bit more technique. They showed it against Missouri. Seems like they did it again. Um, it seems like people kind of understand where they're supposed to be. They've kind of figured out their roles on the yeah. defense. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, so got a much uh, much better push up the middle from the D-line. I thought those guys uh, – I saw Mason out by the numbers a couple of times. Uh, Big Jefferson, you know, really doing a good job of pushing the pocket. And, you know, you don't have to have a lot of sacks as long as you're harassing the quarterback and he Pressure. knows you're around, you know. Uh, getting your hands up in the air, blocking passes. Yep. So I thought that was good. The linebackers uh, were running around in space, making plays. Like you said, uh, Harold is getting more comfortable. And, you know, the thing that um, that really stood out to me was the secondary uh, doing a little bit better job of contesting the ball mm-hmm. when it was in the air. There were a couple plays where, you know, they still had their, you know, their back to the ball and stuff like that. But – they were really – everybody seemed to be more comfortable in their role and uh, flying around making plays instead of worrying about making mistakes and stuff. So, I thought they were – you know, and the thing that I wanted to see was consistency, and they showed that plus some. So, I thought it was a good outing for the defense. I really did. I agree. I, no, obviously, offensively, they did their thing. Yeah. Like they always do. You know, everybody was worried about Jaden – Running, throwing, is he going to be able to do the things? He threw the ball really well. I think this, you know, of every game, you feel like he's getting better and better and better. He's driving these, and we talked about it. Everybody talks about these arm, the arm strength. Like, oh, I want to see him push the ball down the field. If you're a college quarter, Division One college quarterback, you can throw a 45-yard no, route no, no. down no, the no, side. No, no. If, if you can come and play quarterback at this school, for sure, in schools like this right. school, you can make the throws necessary. Right, you and you to, can throw, you can throw the ball with air and get underneath it. You can do it. I think for me, I think the real telling thing and the progression that he's made that everybody wants to see, throwing the ball down the field and taking the top off the defense is not the same as understanding how to go through your progressions and be able to rip a 25-yard in route right behind a linebacker before he gets to the window, right? Like, to me, that's where I've seen the progression from Jaden. You know, obviously, you're a wide receiver, so you've seen quarterbacks, I mean, you got to yeah. catch balls from Jamarcus and those guys. And so you've seen, you've seen guys be able to throw those and make those, make those throws. What have you seen not only from him but from the receivers being able to get open and consistently get in those windows? Um, I think the receivers are doing a better job. I think that's pretty obvious to tell. But when I watch Jaden right now, for, for me, once again, it's not about can you throw the post route, can you throw the end route, can you throw the comeback route. They all can do that at this level. Right. The one thing that he's, I think he's finally doing at the level people have been clamoring for him to do it forever, as if like that stuff just happens overnight, is the processing is becoming next level. Right. The processing of going through the reads, making the decisions, and just ripping it. As soon as he makes the decision, the hard, ripping it. The hardest part of playing quarterback? Yeah, like, you know, <laughs> playing free, playing with not people at your feet all day, playing with a little space in the pocket, playing with some confidence. Stuff like that takes a while when you've had 
three different office of coordinators and then you switch to another school and then an office of coordinator comes again from another conference with a different head coach with a different old line with a different set of receivers sometimes they don't just come together right. overnight like that and it's come together the defensive side it's it's crazy how much cleaning up some defensive line play and those guys starting to play with their hands mm -hmm. Is starting to allow – like, I don't – honestly, I'm, I don't think Harrell's gotten comfortable. I think Harrell's now not getting touched as much as he was. And you're seeing him fly freely. You're not seeing him having to dodge blockers because these guys are getting to the next level. You're seeing him be able to literally play the DN position – I mean, the linebacker position, like you saw him play the DN position last yeah. year where it was just, I'm pinned back and I'm going. Yeah. And I think, like he said, you know, cleaning up those guys' hand positioning, those guys being able to hold up linemen – and they're not being able to roam around freely, it's allowing the defense to play a lot faster, and it's giving everyone confidence. So you're kind of seeing that all clean up. And you saw Spades. This is the first time, obviously, Spades has been banged up, right? Yeah. And Spades came in as an all-Pac-12 linebacker. Yeah. We were expecting a lot of big things from him. Some people had some questions about him. Maybe what Weeks was better. Maybe they should have played him. Maybe the defense looked better with what Weeks there. Maybe, maybe not. He wasn't healthy. He played last night or this past weekend. He looked good. It was the first time I felt like him and – Harold Perkins looked really good on the field at the same time. And to your point, I think that goes a lot to, uh, to credit to the defensive line, trying to figure it out, keeping these guys from the second level, allowing their linebackers to kind of run freely. Because that's why, you know, defensive tackles don't have a ton of tackles. No, yeah. Linebackers have the most tackles because yeah. they're the second level. They're the ones who are supposed to make the tackle. Um, offensive line seems like they're getting better. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and better. Yeah. And better. Well, I know. Emory Jones out. I think dodged a bullet there. Said it's just an ankle sprain. Yeah. Uh, the way they made it he look could, like, he could clearly walk. You know, ahead. he had to make him walk with no shoe on, on crutches. Made it look no, like he broke his ankle. Himself back to die. I've never seen I'm that like, before. Jesus, can we like just put a keep his stuff on so that nobody knows what's going on? <laughs> yeah. you know, but they did that. He goes there. Tommy. They say, hey, out this week. Then they got the bye week. Seems like he's going to be back. But it's a luxury, and, and Brian Kelly said as much, to have a guy like Lance Hurt, Hurd. Zalance Hurd, come in as a true freshman with experience and do it. Yeah. Played well. Play and yeah. and just imagine. Uh, he and Campbell were at the same high school. Were they really? Yeah, they're both at Neville. Were, huh? Wow. Yeah. You think they had fun? Yeah. You think the team didn't? He came in. <laughs> and, Defensive and line? He played well. Yeah, he did. did. He's aggressive. He's big. He's athletic. Oh, he's a mountain. He he's is. A mountain and Will Campbell man. plays. I mean, Will Campbell, I feel like Will Campbell's kind of playing himself into a top five pick when yeah. he comes out. I mean, he is one of the top, if yeah. not the top left tackle in the country. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Lance, I looked him up. He, the, the program says six six three forty. Jesus, a mountain, mountain man, and he can move. Yeah, he's athletic. He I, marched the whole side of the line down a couple of times. Just they don't make them. They don't make them like that. They anymore. don't make them. It's, they they, it's so many of those you could pick from. Yeah. Seems like you make them up there in, in West Monroe, North Louisiana area, a lot more than they make them down here in South Louisiana, which yeah. I don't understand how that happens, but that happens. <laughs> the uh, street coach is a friend of mine, and I text him. I said, what are y'all feeding them boys? Yeah. I mean, they got big-ass dudes yeah. playing offensive line. We don't get that really down here. And no. You get that. You get the receivers yeah. and the D-backs and, you know, some linebackers. And um, Speaking of D-backs. Jared called it. Little progressions. Little Everybody. progressions, but here's what's interesting to me. Did y'all notice that – Denver Harris came on the field in third down? Oh, there we go. That is exactly. exactly. Um, I watched. What would be the reason for that? You know, would it be because he's a good cover guy, but the other things kind of are coming a little bit slower to him? Personnel. Yeah. You know, just it's about who's, who's coming out on the field and what you're asking all those other guys to do. You right. Put a more athletic person out there to make yeah. plays. Um, I think, and I think it could be personnel and or chances are maybe they saw something on film that mm -hmm. they wanted to stick to certain type yeah. of coverage on third yeah. down. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's something that he's been excelling at over the past yeah. couple of weeks in playing. So they said, you know what, we'll simplify this for you. This is what you've been doing really well. This is when we'll get you out there. Yep. So I mean, Zai Alexander looks a lot better. Yeah. He looks like he's getting more comfortable. I feel like he's the best corner we have right now. You know, he gave up some catches, but they were contested catches. It wasn't like he was getting beat. He had a pass interference where after watching, rewatching the game, it was, but watching it from the game live, I'm like, I, feel like he beat, I feel like he beat the guy to the spot, but he had the arm wrapped around. He's playing better. I think that all bodes well for the future of LSU, right? Now, obviously, what, you're going to say something? Yeah, I just think that it, a lot of people are going to say that Auburn wasn't very good going into this game, and you could say that if you want, but they went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Texas A&M, went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Georgia, 
and you get Auburn and you shellac them. I just you go you win by for, thirty. I just don't I don't like that, and I know he'll agree with yeah. this when I say this is your schedule is your schedule, yeah. and when you play teams that's that what, are not very good and they hang around to the fourth quarter, that's you telling me that you're not very good either. Yeah. That you're not doing what you're supposed to do. When you play teams that are not very good, whether it is a oh, no. conference opponent and or way less, and you beat them the way you did, you're telling me a lot about your team yeah. as well. Like, you got to still play the game. Yeah, and so, you, like, that doesn't matter to me. Yeah, you have to play better than the level of your opponent, especially in the Southeastern Conference because you never know what's going to happen. I mean, they will, you know, we've had teams show up and beat the brakes off of us that we're right. supposed to beat. Well, and that's that, one of the things. You have to beat the teams that you're supposed to and be highly competitive against, you know, the Alabamas yep. and, and the other people. Because you, you, you saw Grambling go up and down the field when you three straight drives, and then do you think they're better than Auburn? I wouldn't say so. But yeah, you see tackles. the level of competition that LSU put on the field was so much more advanced right. in and the last three weeks. Like, the defense is getting better. Absolutely. And the yeah. beauty of it is they're able to keep them as a one-dimensional team, right? Auburn wasn't a good big uh, – they don't throw the football very well. They run the football very well. I think the second or third ranked rushing offense in the SEC, LSU only gave up 130 yards total offense. I mean uh, – Rushing yards, I think their starting running back had like 16 yards on seven carries. So like they kind of shut that down. To me, that's a huge thing for the defense. If you can hang your hat at least on one side of that, I think the other, the, you know, the, the secondaries didn't get better because of it. You move past that, right? You've, you've won. You kind of get a break in the SEC schedule. You play arm. We talked about last week um, how cool it is. It's the first time I, since, I think since 1931 that LSU's playing Army. At, and uh, well, I think ever. I mean, since 1931. But... Definitely here in Baton Rouge. Um, Huey P. Long, that whole regime. The last time that I was in LSU Lakes, they said, I saw a tweet, it was when LSU Lakes were a swamp. It wasn't a lake yet. So it's, you know, it's been a long time. I think it's really cool that they get to do that. Um, but as a, from a strength coach's perspective and from a coaching perspective, you get through this gauntlet of the SEC, right? Then you go and you play Army, which you should be, you know, handedly, but, you know, you, you want to respect all the opponents. You don't want to just overlook them to the bye week, but then you have the bye week. How does that affect preparation? Like, what do you have to do as a coach, strength coach, to prepare these guys for, hey, we have a game, but we also have a little bit of a break after that. How do you keep them sharp mentally and also yeah. keep them help, healthy physically? Yeah, so the main – the first thing is you got to – you have injuries. You know, you, you've got guys that are – you know, walking on one leg and, you know, they're sore here, they're sore there, they're banged up, hands, elbows, you name it. So uh, the main thing is to take care of those guys, make sure that you continue to train through those injuries, and then you're going to look at the data. You're going to look at the force plate data. You look at practice velocities, practice loads, and then you come up with a plan. For me, it was always a struggle. Uh, you know, motivating the team, pushing them through games like this. But, you know, because everybody thinks that they're going to, you know, hang 40 on Army. But you got to continue to prepare like you're playing Auburn or Alabama or Florida. You have to. Um, to borrow a term from Coach Saban, he would always say, you're either getting better or you're getting worse. You don't ever stay the same. And that's true, especially in sports and in football especially when your team is just now starting to play well, you want to maintain that momentum and go out there every day and practice like you're playing Georgia. And that's hard for young men, mm -hmm. especially when they, you know, they're reading the newspaper clippings and, you know, guys start drinking the Kool-Aid. They've had a little bit of success. And it's kind of like a, you know, so I've heard it put this way. Uh, you know, you make a, you make a C – on the first test, you come back and make an A, and then you kind of relax and make a D on the final. You know, you don't want you don't want your guys to do that. You want to keep pushing hard. And you know, I personally hated the open week before the Alabama game. I mm -hmm. always hated that. Well, they get it too. Too, I don't like that. Yeah. But. Well, yeah. How'd that work out? But, <laughs> you know, so, but here's you're what I did. You know, so we were always, especially you know, since coach has been in Alabama. We were always in second place, kind of, you right. know. And so it gave us, two, our players, two weeks to hear from everybody, what are y'all going to do against Bama? Right. What are y'all going to do against Bama? What are you going to do against Bama? And then the coaches have two weeks to prepare, and you end up with these, 
these big game plans, you know. And I always thought it would be better to compete uh, from a position of strength than it mm -hmm. was a position of weakness. So this time around, and here we are talking about Alabama, but this time around, you know, we've got more momentum than they do right now. Right. So they're kind of wearing the same hat we wore for so many years. Um, but, yeah, you just want to keep training, man, and take care of the guys that have injuries and keep getting better. That's the main thing. Is there something specifically you do, like, strategic, strategy-wise, to keep these guys – because they're young, right? Like, is there something – I know there's not a magic potion for anything, but is there something that you can do specifically to, like, hey, yeah. stop Recruit. reading that shit? Yeah. Uh, you know, there's so much that yeah. goes into it. And it depends. Like, some teams, they didn't care. They didn't care who we were going to play, when we were going to play, where we were going to play, and other teams. And, you know, so let me go back to Auburn. So when I was watching the game and watching it on TV, their sideline looked dead to me. Right. Like they looked unenthusiastic. There didn't seem to be a lot of emotions. Guys would make plays, and it was a little high five down by the side. And, you know, like kind of nonchalant. Yeah. And um, you don't want – you know, first of all, nobody wants to be on that team. But you have to combat that, you know, especially going into a big game like LSU-Auburn. That stuff has to be taken care of weeks before the game ever comes around. Or a chair yeah. has to come out. Or smash a chair. <laughs> <laughs> Go, yeah. boys. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot. Look, there's a lot. There's some techniques out there that, you know. That's one of one. Not everybody know, can, can know what goes on you know, in yeah. those moments before. There's some things that come out. There's, I'm sure there's a lot of things that probably not. Listen, I walked in. Locker room the, is the locker room, if you ask. Listen, you I know? walked in the locker room one time. Hey. It was, maybe it was, it was seven, 2017, right? And it was before the Arkansas game. I had some buddies in town from Detroit. And they're like, I want to see LSU, right? Coach O is still there, obviously. And we were on the field. Before the game, they saw it. And then right before they came out, we were in the locker room, which is sacred. Crazy. Like, I've never done that. Right now, we weren't there, like, right the same. But it was, you know, pretty close. These guys are getting ready. They're going through the last little bit of walkthroughs. And, you know, you're getting fired up. You're getting them fired up. All of a sudden, I see um, – I see uh, – why well, can't I remember his name? Linebacker. Street coach. 40. Devin White. Devin White. Jesus. Oh. I see Devin White walking around, head down, not looking at anybody, straight down, talking to himself, basically telling him, I wasn't supposed to live. I ain't supposed to be here. I ain't supposed to. I'm like, oh, my God. He made, like, 15 tackles that game. Like, people don't realize what went goes full, in there He mentally. went full like, preacher man and Friday yeah, it night was lights. Like, my buddy looked at me, and he goes, Oh, God. I'm, I'm, this is my favorite part. Well, I'm scared of him. Like, yeah, <laughs> this, was, this, was always, like, this was always one of those type of weeks where I, I can remember it was – if workouts, if you had to be at a workout at seven o'clock and it was mm -hmm. always you were there ready for seven o'clock, well, this was the week you should probably show up at six fifty-five. Yeah, like it's and that message was going to be driven home the entire week until he and the rest of the staff felt like that was understood. So if that took all the way up until game time, yeah. so be it. But that was as soon as the week started and you you know turned the page, it was always we're not letting up. Okay, so like we're not walking out of here with the two score win you go do what you're supposed to do and it starts on Monday when you show up through the rest right. of the week. And have you ever seen where it goes Monday 655, Tuesday 650, Wednesday 645, Thursday 6 where you I start wish seeing we some buy in? Not that much. But <laughs> no, I'm, no, I'm saying like I'm, I'm saying like people start showing up like you start seeing people earlier than yeah. you normally did. Um well that that only happens once. You know, guys show up late especially in a week like this. Uh that would only happen once. Oh, yeah. Well, so, um, yeah, you know, the momentum should go, you know, should grow throughout the week. Guys should be more intent, uh, getting dialed in, getting, you know, in the book, getting in the playbook, watching more film. And you can tell. You can just tell. You can tell from the first time they walk in the weight room on Monday where their mind's at. Yeah. Every time. Uh, so I have, a, I have a question. Like, this kid's going to be a, a star. He's going to be all SEC, at least I think so. You know, God willing, doesn't get hurt or anything like that. But 
you know, people, we've talked, we talked a little bit last week about some of these freshmen. There's reasons why some of these freshmen aren't playing as much as, you know, somebody in the stands wants to say. I mean, we talked, we, we talked, you know, hey, this guy wants Where's Harold, Harold Perkins? Perkins. This guy wants he's Harold playing. Perkins in the game, and he's actually in the game making tackles. <laughs> and, you know, it's like, you know, they say, they say things, or they see things, or they yeah. hear things, and they repeat it, and they, you know, that's just what they know. You know, one of those guys has been Caleb Jackson. Right? Oh. And he has been, every time he touches the ball, he it feels like he makes a big play. He almost took one to the house as a kickoff return. Then he ran over a guy again. And, you know, very physical, obviously talented enough. But that position, there's more to, to that position than just toting the rock and yeah. getting yards and scoring touchdowns, right? And an offense that throws the football, an offense where you have, pro. you have to have pass pro. And to me, that's the hardest thing for a running back to yeah. either commit to or figure out, right? And I guess... Speak on that, right? How hard is it for a freshman running back to be able to have all of that and be able to understand those concepts? And is that the biggest reason why some of these guys don't play early on? So, you know, I remember uh, talking to Stephen Ridley when he was drafted by the Patriots, and we were talking about uh, there had been all kinds of good reports and stuff coming out, but he, he didn't start. So I guess it was the, the, his, his rookie year they had an uh, a, a open date and he came to Baton Rouge, and we were talking, and, and I asked him, I said, Steve, when are they going to put you in the game? And he said, I'm not going into the game until Tom says I can go in the game. And he said, until Tom Brady trusts me to protect him, he's not going to let me in the game. All right, now, go back even further. When Joe Adai got to the Colts, he said he was struggling in the first couple of days of training camp, and he said – Peyton told him after dinner or after meeting, said, hey, uh, stay up. I'll be up there, and you and I are going to go through the playbook. And, and Joe said that every night that once everything was finished, Peyton would come to his room, and they would sit there and go over the playbook. That's because, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That's, you saw the talent. That's how important it is. Well, well you have – as a running back, you're usually picking up the free blitzer. Yeah. Right. All right, so along those lines, Joe, Joe would come back and work with our running backs and show them how to chip. Well, he kicked Joe John Emery out in, the game. Do what? He kicked John Emery out the game. With, yeah. and, and <laughs> for not pass, for not pass pro. Yeah. So that is an art. And plus the way, you know, those guys have a, a running start. And yeah. You're on the receiving end of it most of the time. All right. Yep. So you got to be physically, you got to be mentally prepared, and you got to know what the heck's going on because you get somebody hurt. Yeah, no doubt. And including yourself. Yeah. But the, here's another thing, though. Who's he gonna Who's he gonna beat out? As talented he is, and part. that's where we always were running yep. back yeah. wise here at LSU. We always had a stable of backs, and people would say, "Where do y'all get all those backs?" And so South I ten, baby. Yeah. <laughs> well let me tell you this. Like Josh Williams, Josh Williams is is a serious man. Yeah. And you know, if you notice, he's always in there during you know, on third down. Because one, he's got great hands, he, he can read the coverages, he knows how to get out of the backfield, he's gonna be, you know, steady in the blocking. But that dude that dude takes his craft seriously. Yeah. Yeah. Josh, there is no play in Josh. Yeah, Josh right. is serious about playing running back at LSU. Yeah. And then, you know, so you got a plethora of guys, but he's going to be really good. Absolutely. And I'm glad I like seeing him return kicks. I think that's a great way to kind of ease the guy in yes. there. Like, okay, hey, special good. teams is definitely the way to. But it's also funny, too. I don't think people really, truly, truly understand. Like, first off, different positions have different reasons as to why it's hard to get on the field as a freshman. But this conference especially, and I know it's so easy for the national narrative to be that, oh, it's kind of created the same, and, it's the, it, it, and it, it really isn't. It, this conference is so hard to get on the field at that age as a freshman because there is so much talent, so much experience at every position that it's, like he said, respectfully, who is he going to beat out to right. get 70% of the snaps right, right. now? Who? And, and who, who can we really say? And, not, and not, it's not just to say him. You know, we can go around from right. position to position, but that's what this conference is. And it takes a little time for you to kind of be able to get out there and learn it because 
guess what? If you can't do it yet, which chances are you can't at this level, there's some dudes that are bigger, stronger, more experienced, and almost ready to go to the next level that are there doing it already. No doubt. So, and that was going to be my next point. Obviously, they want to see him get more carries, and like they're trying, but you have a running back and Logan Diggs, he's probably going to rush for over 1,000 yards. I mean, oh, yeah. definitely going to rush for yeah. over 1,000 yards, barring any injury. Yep. You have John Emery, who, you know, obviously – Brian Kelly really likes because he keeps he's allowing him to get in there and he's made some really big plays this past weekend. So he's starting to get his legs underneath him. Then you have Josh Williams who is steady Eddie. You know exactly as what you're reliable get. as they come. Is reliable like he's going to pass pro. He's going to catch these balls. He's going to get the tough yards. You're going to put him in the goal line. He's going to score a touchdown. That's just the way it is. So you have three guys that you feel real confident in. There's no reason to rush a, a guy in just to do it. And Brian Kelly's proven that he's not going to just throw a guy in just to throw a guy in. Right, he's gonna. Which he has is a, good. Which is it's a good, good thing. It's good for the kid, and it's good for everybody yeah. else. Right. Yeah. I I would venture to say in this conference, you're probably in a bad spot as a program if you have to throw out multiple freshmen yeah. all over the field. Or if you just throw them out there just just so the fans are. are well, happy you're right. in a bad spot fans as a coach. Know. Period. If that's why you're doing fans it. Are, listen, but, fans are saying Jaden Daniels shouldn't have been the starter. Now they they think he should win the Heisman. Right. Like they're fans for a reason, yeah. which is fine. I'm not trashing fans. It's every fan base yeah. ever. Right. Let me see the guy, the next best thing. That's what we hear about how good is he going to be. They don't see what's going on behind the scenes. There's some, there's some development issues. There's things that they need to do, right? And so I'm happy that he doesn't do that. I'm happy that, you know, he doesn't seem like he's a guy who's going to, you know, really fold to the, the pressure thing, of, he, he hasn't been of here, public. He hasn't been here long enough at LSU because, let's be honest, of the LSU fan base, you can go across it, 99.9% of LSU fan base does not, has not followed Brian Kelly's career long enough for you to question decisions he's making right. in year two. Right. Right? Like, the right. guy's got a list of 10, 10 plus win seasons for a reason. Believe yeah. in the decisions he's making. Go ahead and let him make the decisions, yeah. and then we'll see where this thing kind of goes. But Siri agrees. Siri agrees. Siri's with me. Well, but he hasn't been here long enough for people to be questioning that, that stuff. That's what I've been saying kind of like the entire time is people are so used to being able to – it almost felt like influence the coach. For, for Les Miles, Ed Orgeron, like the, the pressure of public opinion, you finally had a guy that feels like came in with a plan, and it was a three-year plan in his mind of he's a victim of his own success and the right that he won the West in his first year. And then everybody expected LSU like, oh, well, now national championship. Well, I'm glad you're saying that. I'm glad you brought up. Victim of his own success, national championship, all these types of things. If you look at the SEC right now, I don't want to say the SEC is down, <laughs> right? But I am going to say that there's a lot more parity in the SEC yeah. than there has been in a long time. Feels like the Pac-12. Brock Bowers out for four to six weeks. Better. That is the be yeah ankle surgery. Crazy tight rope. rope. Tight rope. Yeah, tight rope surgery on his ankle. High ankle sprain. They're going to have that tight rope. Do the whole thing. Obviously. Oh. The face of the tightrope surgery. You think George is Tua. nervous? Yeah. Yeah. The face <laughs> of the tightrope surgery is Tua. Tua has had tightrope surgery before. Two Apparently weeks. had a comp complication. I do it again. Uh huh. Ooh. Played in that played in that national championship game against Georgia. So they've seen on the other side. They're hoping that Brock could do the same thing. But my point is, without Brock Bowers, their best player offensively, you know, they've shown some vulnerabilities. Obviously, their defense is so good. Alabama's obviously shown some vulnerabilities. A and M looks like they're in a the bad mind. spot. And look. <laughs> Couldn't happen to a better program. <laughs> I love that you said that. And like, I know you're here with Jimbo, and I know Jimbo's doing his thing over there, but boy, they're in a bad spot. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> that sets up for the last game of the season. Uh, make, we were talking, makes it a little more dangerous for us, but yeah. Tennessee goes and beats AM last week, 20 to 13. You know, you have a lot of parity in the SEC. With that said, LSU can, wins against Army. They're 6-2 and two going into the bye week. They go out and they, they do their thing. Everything's open. If you're in the SC and you win the SC championship, you're, you're going the to the playoff. You're, you're at worst in the conversation. Yeah. At worst in the conversation. Right? And so I feel like they still have everything in front of them. I think they're probably playing the best of any team in the SEC right now. Would you agree? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah, I would say so. Or most momentum. It's hard, well, it's hard to say, you know, based on who Florida and Tennessee played this weekend. So it's kind of hard to base it off of that. Um, but, yeah. The, and those are two Eastern Division teams. As far as teams in the West, they're playing as good as anybody. Right. I mean, Florida, Graham Mertz finally, you know, threw for some yards and, and won the game for them, basically. Yeah. They played yeah. against South Carolina. South Carolina – 
right? That's who they played last week, right? South yes, Carolina? yes, yeah. yes, yes. They South won. Carolina, and they obviously are a team that can sneak up. They have a, a pretty good quarterback. They have a good coach, and they've done some things. They've been in a bunch of games, you know, but – I think that Florida LSU game is going to be a little more interesting now Ooh, than it was. I feel like uh, I feel like we're prophets, but we're like obviously not. not we just prophets. we've had the Speak benefit. For yourself. We've had the benefit of being around ball, being around locker rooms, being a part of stuff like this for long enough to where you just you get a better insight of what's going on, right? But we said it literally Monday morning or Monday afternoon after they lost to Ole Miss and gave up a million yards. We we're like, believe it or not. It's probably still going to be a 10 win season. It's just a matter of if it's going to happen regular season or postseason. And everything they wanted to do before the year, truthfully, still right there in front of them. Yeah. Yeah. Like, Look at who they lost to. Right. Florida State. Holy mackerel. Right. Right. Exactly. When you've, when you've lost to Florida State and then you lost, it really didn't matter, honestly, to who else. Because of the fact that it was before October, when you can go October, November through this conference and put yourself into that conference championship game. I don't care what anyone wants to say. You are at worst in the conversation exactly. at the end of it. Well, and that's, that's, what, that's what, where they're going to be. But that's what makes fans upset is the fact that you're not getting – how can you progress from that after year one to year two? They're like, well, playoff spot, national championship. instead, And that's just not how it works realistically. Like, are you going to be upset with a 10-win season again Well, and win the West again? Yeah, and, and you spoke about – like, you spoke about the three-year plan, like – that's not that's like across the board. Let's be honest. You come in and it's somewhat of a three year plan across the board for every coach in pretty much every situation, right? You can't I get here, I can't bring all the bodies in on one. Then when I do bring the bodies in on one, if you're doing it right, the bulk of it, players on the team. Well, when if you're doing it right, the bulk of it's gonna be freshmen anyway. So mm-hmm. I'm gonna throw them out there and be a, a playoff team? No. So that takes them another year to get right. So it's pretty much a three year plan for any coach in any situation that it is. It just so happens that he came into a, a program that is Bro, it's loaded here every right. year in and year out. And if you can coach, he goes out there and gets you 10 in year one. Right. But it's still not right. where he exactly wants it to be, and that's pretty clear. Right. You're a football fan in general, right? Not just – I mean, you're an LSU guy. You've been here for yeah. so long. But you're a football fan. You've been in a bunch of different places. What is your take on everything right now that's happening in college football as far as parity? Look, the Pac-12 is not going to be any there anymore. Right, they're, they're saying that they're going to try to rally around the two teams that are or four teams that are still going to be there, but you know they're having the best season, their best, this is the best their conference has looked in a long time. Since 2005, now, USC yeah. got got the big breaks beat off of them by Notre Dame. They got reality check yeah. right there. Right, Caleb Williams, the little run around three ad- picks. He had three three picks. interceptions. Three didn't throw for 200 great. either. No, yeah. the run around, spin around, Heisman shakeup, ad libbing, like you know. I think Washington's good, obviously. Yeah, Washington yeah. State's not bad. Either. Washington State's not bad. They got boat, but they got boat terrible. race this weekend by somebody, didn't they? The Washington State? Mm-hmm. Oh, by a non-ranked team, too, I believe. I don't know. I'm, you know, I'm Colorado pretty sure was about hot. It. Stanford, then they lost to Stanford. Up 28. You know, they're up 29 yeah. nothing. That yeah. was a crazy game. But as far as what you're seeing parity-wise, obviously Texas, Oklahoma. 44-6. You know, ACC State has lost. a couple teams. 44-6. What do you? What is it? Forty-four to six, six. Washington State. Forty-four guy. to six. Yeah, I Arizona. Thought, yeah, they Arizona got, beat them forty-four to six. Right now, right now, Arizona is Arizona's going to get better, man. Why is that? Because of their head coach and uh, what's the guy's name? So really, he was a he's a former NFL guy, very you know very organized. They're recruiting. You know the NIL helps. Yeah. And so they're getting kids that they hadn't gotten before. They put together a great staff. They have Jed Fish. Do what? Jed Fish. He's an Jed NFL Fish, guy. NFL guy. They've got um, they've got an incredible staff. So don't don't sleep on Arizona. They're yeah. a sleeper team of mine. And I think I think the Arizona State staff. went the other way with Herm Edwards. Yeah. And then yeah, you got they, well, this guy's a little different. Than That's Herm. what I'm saying. It yeah, was you get the tail of two lifelong yeah. assistant. This is his first head coaching job. Yeah. Uh, okay. But so you know, I think NIL has a lot to do with it. Right. Because schools that that we're not going to cheat, and so they didn't get certain guys. Are now getting those guys because of NIL, right? Parity. So yeah, parity. Um, that and the transfer portal helps tremendously. Yeah. Uh, you don't miss, and you know it's not good for high school kids, man. Like I talk to a lot of high school coaches, and they're all struggling right now with um, high school kids. Unless you're a five-star, unless you're somebody like 
Harold the two Perkins. big kids from uh, Neville. Unless mm-hmm. you're somebody like that or Emory Jones, you know, a, a five-star, four-star, five-star, you're not getting recruited. You're going to go to a junior college or a smaller school. But what's good for that, it's like the minor leagues, man. Yep. You develop. You get to play. And it was always tough for me as a coach when you have a kid that's been promised the world, he commits, he signs, and then he comes here and doesn't play. It was tough managing right. that, especially in season. How did you manage that? Well, well, you just tell I mean, them to yeah, shut you... up and go to work. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the only way you can do it. Well, I mean, yeah, yeah, get out of here. You know, because I was, I, I would, I never did that. I was never in a position to right. do that. I, I had a job to do, and I would say, look, man, that's, I mean, just keep getting better. Yeah. Don't, don't focus on the results. Focus on the process. Let's get better. Do, how much film did you watch last night? You know, how much extra have you done? How many balls have you caught? You could tell the guys that sit there and catch balls after practicing the jugs machine and run routes. Joe would sit and Joe would throw to anybody after practice. Joe would have eight guys out there. Peyton would have eight guys out there, and then they'd all come to the weight room. So, anyway, now with the portal, guys are going to smaller schools. They're playing earlier. They, you know, they make a name for themselves. They get plucked off a roster. I have a friend whose son isn't a starter at a school. He's a backup, but he's already getting, you know, calls and stuff from bigger schools because. Which is not illegal. In the NFL, they call that tampering. Yes. (laughs) So, yeah, it's probably illegal. (laughs) The the way that they do (laughs) it is they go through high school coaches. They go through friends. There's there's a way. There's There's a way. way. Like, he's not even going to, you know, make spring ball with this team he's on. He'll be somewhere else. So, for the kids, that's good. They develop. Right. And then, so when they show up on Arizona's roster or Washington's, because I wondered how Washington and Ben Onikione, did you ever know Ben? It worked for me, Ben Onikione, big Italian guy from Mm. Pittsburgh with tattoos. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. He's the (laughs) shrink. Put the pieces together. Yeah, big, big, big Italian with tattoos. So he's the strength coach at Washington. And then you look at, I mean, not Washington, Washington State, Washington, how those two teams did what they did this year. But it has to be NIL and Portal. So yeah. I think that's the biggest difference. Absolutely. Because you see teams like Alabama where Nick Saban is kind of clearly upset about it because you can't gray shirt four stars anymore. They're going to find a place, whether it be Juco yeah. for a year, like you get offers. And it's like, okay, if I'm not going to play at Georgia, I can go to JUCO for a year and then get a Washington State offer. Well, I feel like the JUCO route now is like it's going to UL. Springboard instead of going to JUCO. Well, yeah, yeah, the only way, like Damian Lewis, you know, the the Mm -hmm. guard that we – the right guard, uh, D. Lou went to a JUCO. And I think we talked about this last Mm -hmm. week. He didn't have another offer. Right. So, you know, any kid that you're questionable on whether or not he can play – they're not going to sign him. They're going to get a kid out of the portal. Yeah, I think it, I I I think there's a good chance that once that the 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 COVID the guys that experienced the six any, year guys the six year guys that experienced any of the COVID year or whatever once that's completely removed from the system, I think you're going to go back to seeing kind of what we saw because right now, don't get me wrong, those teams are playing well. That's very obvious. I think I touched on this before, but if you go across. The Pac-12 right now, right? You got Bo Nix, mm-hmm. 22 yeah. years old, six-year guy. You got – Penix. You got Penix, six-year guy. You got the guy at Washington – they got at Oregon State was the guy that was at – Yeah, he was at player. Clemson for four years. Yeah. I guess my point to it is, is I'm not saying that it won't be – Jefferson. I'm not saying – look, we're getting part of Jay it too. Let, let's be honest, yeah. <laughs> so, I'm not saying that it won't be there. I understand that. But I'm saying I think there will be – the pot will be slimmed a little bit and you won't have it as spread out to where you're getting kind of those seasoned guys kind of yeah. across that kind of understand it. But I guess my question for you would be this time of the year, especially down here, because let's just be honest, the the summer heat and the beginning of the season heat that you experience in this conference as compared to any other conference is not, it's unmatched. And that's just the truth of it, right? Is there anything that you would do different when you felt, okay, the weather is changing, I know my guys are conditioned, how do, how do I scale this thing back if I needed to or if I don't? How do I continue to make sure I get them or have them ready to play each week and ready to be in tip-top position? Yeah, so that's a good point. So we actually saw on the linemen when the weather broke, 
about a seven pound increase on average. Oh, wow, game. that's <laughs> nuts. Mm. Well, seven Gumbo, pounds. Coach is gumbo weather. Have I mean, you talked about what, yeah. what your son's well, gumbo and pasta lia? Pasta lia is the go to. Seven pound average. That's for crazy. The big guys. Yeah, of course. Because the weather is so tough, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, here's the key. The key is looking at the looking at the data, the force plate data, the practice data, and making adjustments based on that before. You, everything was based on experience, intuition, and assumptions. Right. But, you know, the last uh, six, seven, eight years that I was in coaching, you had GPS data, which told you everything. And just when the, when the temperature was, the temperature added about 10% to your average heart rate per day when it was hot. Huh. So players that's, are going to be much fresher. Yes, 10%. That's incredible. That's a lot. Yeah. That's incredible. On average, wow. just from the heat. I used to love looking at the heart rates because you could tell everything based on heart rate. You didn't have to look at the other, other stuff. So the big guys tend to gain a little weight, so you got to make sure you talk to them about that. And the key is to look at the data. And, and Jake and those guys over there, they do a phenomenal job. And he's, you know, Dr. Frakes, the nutritionist, is amazing. So they really have a great team set up for this very reason, Mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that they're looking at the data and then addressing nowadays, again, because before it was based on experience, intuition, and assumptions. Now it's based on hard facts. So you can make adjustments for certain guys. Right. You can individualize it a lot more. Uh, this guy needs a little bit of this. This guy needs a little bit of that. This guy needs some eccentric strength. This guy needs some explosive strength. So you prescribe those needs based on what the data shows you. So it's a lot easier now. The players are going to be so much fresher. Once. So Jack used to always say, that training camp here in the south knocked the vigor out of our guys. And until the weather broke, until the second week of October, we didn't get some of our guys. Never got to 100. Well, they got they didn't get their legs back until the second yeah. week of October. Yeah. Because it's so daggum hot. Right. Well, and I think you, that's what, that's what, if you're just a normal human, not yeah. playing sports, the minute you get this little cold front, you walk outside and you got a little bit of a little, little nip energy. In the air. You feel good about yourself. Yeah. Just take your dog general, out. I'll take it for a walk. Imagine yeah. having to be in pads and having to go and sweat your ass off all day, every day. Yeah. Like, do well, you do awesome. you think that's something that's obviously like Nick came from Michigan State. Les was at Oklahoma State. Um, Brian's been in okay. the Northeast. He obviously was at Notre Dame and then Cincinnati before it. And, you know, we've had other coaches come from other areas, too. Do you, you think that's something that's pretty hard for head coaches who may have not played down here or have not coached down here before to, to understand the first time coming in? Because it, it's different. Like, it just is. Yeah, so when uh, our first year here, uh, Coach was upset. Coach Saban was upset because everybody was talking about how hot it was. <laughs> <laughs> and he was – you know, it's not that hot. It's not that hot. And so we had an assistant coach on our staff that would always say, it's not that hot. It's not that <laughs> Just hot. Just make him believe it. Yeah. He started, he was from up north too. And I try not to give out any names. Right, but of course. Right, right, right. So every day, so that was before football ops was built, uh-huh. you know. So we were over in the uh, admin building. So me, Carl Dunbar, and Coach Jenkins would ride to practice together. And uh, and then we would ride to practice, or ride back to the admin building. So one day, I mean, it was in October, and it was we. Uh, so Eric Edwards, the tight end, Eric Edwards, I think, was from Washita. He he cramped up on a Thursday practice one time in October. I mean, <laughs> so we get in the car after practice, and Coach Jenkins leans back because Carl was driving. He leans back and he goes. Man, I'm glad I'm not from Michigan because it's hot. Because <laughs> they would all say it's hotter in Michigan, it's hotter in Wisconsin, it's hotter in Illinois. Pete goes, man, I'm glad I'm not from Michigan because it's hot out there. <laughs> and uh, they just, you know, so they they tried to make out like it wasn't a big deal, but it, I mean, it's 
So we had a, we had a discussion one time that it was hotter in Houston, Texas, because Coach Saban had coached for the Oilers at one point in his career. And he was like, it's not hot, it's not hot. So there's a thing that you have to look at. It's called the wet bulb. And I think here, if the wet bulb is uh, 86 degrees or something, the high schools are not even allowed to practice. And so I got on the Internet, and I started researching it, and we were like two degrees hotter here than what the average wet bulb was wow. in Houston. Is that humidity? Uh, it's um, it's uh, the wet. You know what? It has something to do with humidity. It's like ambient heat and humidity. It's a, it's a, a formula. You put me on the spot here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that. That's news to me. Kind of you know, you know, can't tell you Jack and Andy's responsibility. <laughs> nobody, <laughs> nobody's going to. We could practice or not. Yeah. Nobody's yeah. going to track that over here. I can promise you that. And I got fact checks. You listen. Our Monday shows are a sprint. A little test shorter than normal until for about three more weeks until Mikey's my, flag football team flag lost, football so he has to go back out there. Yeah, I got some new cleats today. Got some oh, let's right. try to, let's try to keep those intact. Huh? The old ones. <laughs> Feel really good about it. Uh, but we still have some time. Uh, but I want to go and I want to talk a little. We talked a little bit about training, right? We talked a little bit about the weather. You know, obviously the Moffitt method is an accumulation of everything that you have learned and experienced and continue to learn because. As you know, it's a wet bulb of knowledge. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> the training world continues to evolve based off of new science, based off of technology, based off of new stuff that you have. In 2000, when you got to LSU to now, the way people are trained a little different, right? Now, well, obviously, I didn't have a calculator or a computer <laughs> right, when I right. got here. So you have more information. Now the general idea of it and the concept of it, you know, they have some, you know, fundamental things that are always gonna be there, but it changes. And a lot of that stuff is put into the Moffitt method, which is an app and it's available to anybody. Um, you consult with high school football teams, college football teams, youth football teams, youth baseball teams, anybody that was looking for some type of guidance mm -hmm. in this field, that's what the Moffitt method does. It's an app, you know, and so obviously, we're very excited that you're on here, but I also am very excited for people to be able to see the Moffitt Method. So can you go out and just explain a little bit more about that too? Yes, so uh, great, great job. I should hire you. You like that? Are you looking really for sales, good. sales reps? Uh, yes, please. Uh, so, John Williams asked, actually yeah. asked me about that today. He asked me if you looking for some sales reps. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so what we do is, first of all, our our goal isn't to replace anyone's knowledge or experience or supervision at a school. Our job is to take what they have done in the past and uh, progress because what happens, and I'm going to tell you a story. So we got a call from a Division Three college basketball program in the state of New York. And the head basketball coach was the strength coach. And he says, Coach, I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing. We work out five days a week. We do five sets of ten every time they come in the weight room. Oh, boy. And we do the same <laughs> workout every day. You, you got you that help? call this year? I said, absolutely. <laughs> oh, wow. Boy. We can help. <laughs> so what happens is unless your school – has a certified strength, a nationally certified strength and conditioning coach, or someone whose sole responsibility is the weight room, um, they're not going to be able to give you the level of expertise that me and our team has experience with. Uh, you know, I did it for 33, 30 something years at John Curtis, Tennessee, Miami, and LSU, and I was exposed to a lot of the uh, high level training principles that are applicable to young men and women of any age. But people are intimidated by some of the means and methods or they just don't know that they exist. Right. There was a guy named Gary Frank who actually lives in central Louisiana. And he was, uh, at one time, he was the strongest man in the world, first person First person to squat a thousand pounds, uh, made the U.S. Olympic team in the shot put. Yeah, he played for Mississippi State. Uh, uh, did, could not go to the Olympics because he went to the combine, signed with the agent, 
but he ended up playing defensive line, no, offensive line for the Pittsburgh Steelers, played in the NFL, had about an eight or nine year career. So he's a, he's a friend of mine. So we were sitting down talking one time about what he did as a kid growing up, because obviously he was right. a freak show. And he said, as a kid growing up, uh, I grew up in Wisconsin. My dad, we didn't have any weights at the house, but we, we sprinted and we jumped all the time sprinted and jumped and I didn't start lifting weights until I got to high school and that is usually one of the last things that people do you know they bench they curl and they run laps around the football field and and that is considered conditioning that's not what we do you know so we look at us we do a needs analysis first we look at everything that the school or the parent has available in the garage or in the gym and then we sit down and devise a customized program for them, and then we make it progressive over 52 weeks. Right. Out I, think of the that's, year. I think that's the difference, right? You have a lot of people giving you direction or workouts or teaching you how to do something, but it's really only for a short period of time. Right. You're giving them a program and you're evolving with them because you're going to give me a program and I'm going to do it for a month. At the end of that month, I'm going to be a different person than I was when that month started. So I don't want to still just do the same stuff. I want to evolve with my body or with my I want to get better because I've gotten better. And that, yeah, and that's well, exactly what you do. So the, and, and this is what I tell people all the time. Training for most people is broken down into three phases. Three weeks, three months, three years. If you do anything for three weeks, you're going to start seeing some results. Then you take it to the next level. You go three months. Now you're starting to see some real results. But then when you take that same progress and you do it over a period of three years, you see what we call long-term physical adaptation. And that's when, and our goal is for every one of our clients, when their team or their at, or when my son walks on the field, they say, holy mackerel, what's that kid been doing? Right. Or, you know, when the offensive line takes the field, they go, holy mackerel, what have those guys been right. doing? The Moffitt method. And that's our goal. Right. And, and you, to you, make a difference in young men, we make a difference in injury rate and make a difference in performance. That's our goal. And if you look at the timeline, three weeks, three months, three years, you get into a high school program, right? Those freshmen, three weeks, three months, three years, by the time they get one year, two years, three years, they're gonna be in their junior, going into their senior year, and that's the time where you're, you, you know, especially depending on the high school, counted on to be a starter, counted on to be able to, you know, do the things <coughs> the guys above you did and be, or be better, or get, get, get recruited, recruited you be have an opportunity. So the timeline fits, it's just a matter of, it's, there's nothing that happens like this, no. right? And if you do take that, if there is something, it's illegal, and your Ooh. body's gonna break down at some point when you get off of it, not probably, good. not good for you. So this is really, there's nothing that like this, the progression of strength and conditioning isn't easy. Right. I like guess something you gotta commit to, but mm -hmm. I think this is a good way because if you have direction, follow this and go and do it. Yeah, and so our goal is to stay with the school throughout that entire process. So let's say, for instance, and I think we talked about this last week, if you're at St. Thomas More or you're at New Iberia Senior High or some other West school. Gay. West Gay, baby. Oh, wait, my but, bad. You know. Menard. You know. My bad. Know. So <laughs> close. I was close right across, <laughs> basically right across the bayou. But – if you're at a school, let's say, for instance, your offensive line coach is the strength coach. Right. If he gets a job and goes somewhere else, there goes your strength program. We didn't have one. Yeah, well, you know and some schools don't. That's where they go five sets of ten, five days oh, a week. Oh, I know that BFS is bigger, changed. faster, stronger. Yeah. And so that's where we come into play. We're not going anywhere. It doesn't matter to us who the head coach is, who the assistant coach is. We have a responsibility to train your team. And through the app, using the app, which drives engagement because of all the tools that the app has, kids are going to, they are going to know days in advance what's expected of them. There's, you can video, if I'm a coach at the high school level and there's an exercise that we're doing and 
I have a particular player who's not doing very good on it. I can take within our app and video that young man or that young lady squatting or power cleaning or pressing the bar overhead and hit save. And then our coach on the other end gets that video and can send notes or call the coach up and tell them, have them do this, this, this. Let's make a change to that player, not the whole team. Let's make a change to that player and have them do this, and you'll see improvement. So the last question, you have a question? Well, I was about to say, no, go ahead. But, well, before you ask the last question, too, I just kind of want to yeah. put in, too, for, for the ones that are out there listening, like, Today, there's a lot of information that's literally readily available you for you, that. and it's right yeah. at your hands. And so much of it could be fool's gold, and it could just be great marketing, but not good information. But the one thing I would like to add to this is, like, please understand that listening to this man talk and the team that he's assembled and put together, you're not going to find anything right. better out there. I, there's a lot like, of Instagram I coaches. I absolutely promise you there's a lot of Instagram coaches. There's a lot of people that claim they have this, may have that certification, this and that. Take this. The, the absolute experience that he's been around, that he's got, the knowledge that he's gained and that he can kick to you, there, there isn't anything better out there. No doubt. Well, and you're it, not going to surround yourself. My, I guess my next question was you're not going to surround yourself with people who don't follow you You're the same way you think as far as training and evolving. Um, you're not just going to hire someone just to have a body there to say, hey, I need you to do this. You have people that are handpicked by you to coach these kids or programs or whatever. How many people do you have that are working with you in conjunction with you to say, hey, we have these programs. You're going to get me to look at it, plus you're going to look at some of these other coaches. Do you have other coaches with yeah, you? So, yes, we do. We have, we have a staff of four right now. I'm actually going to start interviewing somebody um, this week because we're getting busy. What time am I coming in? Yeah. <laughs> All he wants to talk about is steroids. Right. He's looking for the cheat code. He, yeah. yeah. He, he wants to hit the easy button. Oh, yeah, no big doubt. time. Uh, but yes, yeah, so we, we have a, we have a staff of four and we're getting busy, 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 busy. Um, and you know, the good thing about our business is it's cyclic. So, you know, we get busy the month before the semester starts and then it slows down and you can breathe because what we have to do whenever we get contacted from a client. We have to put together a program mm -hmm. that we present to them, and that takes time. Right. Right. Uh, sometimes uh, that school might not purchase the product, and then that was 8, 10, 12 hours that we spent where we could be doing something else, training right. somebody. So that's, that's one thing that we're still working through right now and learning and because this is not a cookie cutter program right we're not going to have school a do the same thing that school b does but you know so jared made a in, uh, interesting point you know a lot of people train high school players like they're major league baseball players mm -hmm. or professional football players or professional basketball players because that's what they see on instagram mm -hmm. they see professional players doing x but that, they don't see all of the work that those people did to get to where they're at. Right. You were a high school football player. Mm -hmm. You spent some time in the squat rack, bench, and benching and squatting and power cleaning. Same with you. You mm -hmm. two were both football players. You just so happened to it, wait, what did he say? About <laughs> he that? said three. three. He said he was one, two. <laughs> oh, well, if you put my kid in the boat, I get to be in the high school football boat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But. I'm, these guys played professional baseball. <laughs> oh, that's pivot. That's my point. So <laughs> the program that you did when you were at that level right. didn't look like the program that you that's did right. when you were young. And that's where people miss the boat because they see what some major league player is doing and they think that that's what their son needs to be doing. Right. But you miss out on the development. And that's why there's such a big push now for kids to – against early specialization right. in kids to play more than one sport because you get a multifaceted development. And that is go. critical. It is critical. So you're running and jumping and sprinting and lifting, squatting, hinging, and you do that. And with our program, so if you're, if you're a football player and, and y'all probably experienced some of this or had peers that experienced this, a lot of school programs – 
the football coach and the basketball coach and the baseball coach, they don't want guys playing other sports or doing the football workout. Okay, so when you're using the Moffitt method, when you go from football to base, basketball to baseball or track and field, you're going to go from locker room to locker room, and there's similarities within that program that carries over mm -hmm. to the other sports. So you're not going from one training philosophy to maybe not training to another training philosophy, and then you're expected to pick up where you left off when football season starts, right. when right. football workout starts. That's not the way it is with us. So, you know, and that's one reason that I do the podcast is, you know, one of the questions that I ask every host, whether you're a basketball string coach or a baseball string coach, how do you train your players? How do you recommend that young men and women train? Mm -hmm. And because that's, you know, I've done 40 something episodes now and it's been 40 some odd individual, you know, right. skull sessions right. with me. And they all stay, say the same. In fact, and I'm Andrea Hootie is the men's basketball strength coach at Connecticut. And she's been all over the country. She's coached some of the greatest basketball programs from Kansas to Yukon women to Texas. She's coached them all. And she, and she says that one of the one of the worst things is how undeveloped that young basketball players are mm -hmm. or young athletes when they get to college. They're underdeveloped because they spend all of their time playing the sport versus – and it's tactical and technical preparation versus physical preparation. Right, right. And from the age of 13 to 18, the growth in, during that period is exponential. And you have to take advantage of that between the age of 13 and 18 because once you get to 18, it levels off. Mm -hmm. and the, your your room for improvement is very slim. Right. So it's important that you get in that when you're young yeah. and develop so that when you're older, then you focus on that technique. The, and the last little bit I'll add too is that for for the kid, it doesn't matter if you are a like an individual college student that may be interested in their help and their expertise and or a young kid. The one thing that I'm not sure that across the board that you can find is coaches that have two two qualities. One, that are capable, and two, that are willing. Like, I know for a fact he may get a kid at said level and is supposed to be able to do said thing, and if that kid can't do that, one, he's capable of, all right, how can I break this down and get you to where you can do it? And one, that's that's being able to do it, right? Two, that's also willing to do it. So being capable and willing to do those things yeah. as opposed to just saying, here's the program, if you can't do it, I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. That's, and no that doubt. goes back to what he was talking about, of being able to take a picture, being able to send it back, being able to figure out those things. All that stuff matters to being able to individualize that Coach. program. Yeah, and that's what, that's what I was going to say because we have a lot of people in the chat asking if you're not an athlete or just an everyday person, is there anything for that? For Absolutely. Absolutely. So... We have a couple of things, all right? We have two programs, the Moffitt one-to-one, and we're redoing our website right now. We're, um, we've come out with four brand new products, and one of the products, I like this title, you'll like this, it's called Body by Moffitt. Ooh, Ooh. I like that, I like that. I like that. I I and it's, um, it's, it's more geared to, and I don't want to say non-athletic, because anybody that you know goes into the weight room and trains is an athlete in my opinion poker that's not a sport all right you're not it, you don't have to be an athlete i don't even think uh what's that game Bowling? Bowling? you don't have to be an athlete yeah. to do that but if you're going to go and see it every training, saturday you're an athlete <laughs> so for that population of people we're coming out with a brand new product it's called body by moffitt and it is suited for those type of people who aren't compete or aren't I'm training a to compete for a sport well, Whether it, I'm not training to compete for a sport either. I'd be one of those people. Yes. Or, ah. And then now you you would also be a good uh, a good for person the second for version the, of this. Uh, Moffitt one to one, but we're coming out with four new products. So uh, because not a lot of people want to dive into a 52 right. week. They want to sample it. You know, right. they want appetizers. So we have three six weeks programs that we're coming out with. The first one is a six week linear sprint based program so if you want to get faster and your goal is to sprint 
the 40 yards as fast as humanly possible. We have a six-week program, a progressive six-week program with some work capacity built in there because a lot of the people that want to get faster are going to be athletes. So we have that six-week program. We have a six-week, um, three-day-a-week lifting program only. So the sprint program is just running only. The lifting program is lifting only. And then we combine those two for a third product, which is six weeks of lifting and running combined. And okay. so along with the body by Moffitt. So those are our four new products that we're coming out with. So really quick, obviously we've talked a lot about this. There's interest questions in the chat. Um, if they would like to see your website, yeah, the, the website is the Moffitt method dot fit. fit. And you info, can find out. They can email yeah. us at info at the Moffitt method dot fit. Now we have a con, you know, we have all those little widgets on the website, contact us, um, fill that out and we'll be in touch with you within, you know, if you do it tonight, we'll be in touch with you tomorrow morning. Perfect. I appreciate it. As You're always, very welcome, guys. looking thank forward you. to next Monday's conversation. Yes, thank you. It's a uh, football, a lot of football knowledge coming out of here, but also a lot of, you know, I don't want to call it self-help, but. You know, Make you're going to you better yourself strong. by understanding how uh, to work out. We appreciate you, as Thank always. You. See you next Thank Monday. You. Uh, you. We're going to shut this thing down, but we have our two segments. You can just, you know, yeah. whatever you want. We have two segments. We have the Mistake of the Day is brought to you by our friends here at Dozy Place. Lou, what we got for the Mistake of the Day? We have a lot of talk about the old Texas A&M coming in hot as that recirculated. So they thought that they would double down and make a highlight video for what actually goes on for, what are they called? The Milkmen? for whatever they do on a Saturday. Mm -hmm. And this thing is a minute long. The last 30 seconds, it, gets, it goes to the place you think it will. We go to our locker room to go over the game script to eventually run out in Kyle Field. And then that is when the whole fun begins. So we run out with the team, feel the 12th man energy, and we get to our distinguished spots awesome. to lead the Warham and the Yells with the 12th man. We know exactly what we're man. about to do. Not the we get the head yellow. We'll give and a pass back to the 12th man next. <laughs> 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 I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> hey. I'm out. He's good. <laughs> and after this five, is, ten seconds, um, all the yellowers gather on the end zone to leave the warham right in front that's of the tough. Cadets freshman. No, wait, wait for the end. I'm in telling which, right you, we will we not. Here we go. Him, they tackle us and carry us to Fish Pond. In which we then leave the yellow. I did not know that this happened. To finish it all by beating the hell out of the team that we're going to be playing next. Mm. Well, that's what the game day looks like for a yellow leader. We hope to see the 12th man come out and support the Yaggies for Fight Tech Yaggies. They're, They're happy. Thanks. Thank you with it. Okay. Any publicity is good publicity, they say. They that is not it. the case. Mm. That one's tough. Mistake of the day. I think that can always fit in the mistake of the day. I know, but it would just it, it, it circled yeah. back because the old COVID video of them in twenty, I guess twenty twenty, whatever, yeah. there was nobody around, they were doing it, and now they're like, No, this is what it looks like now, and yeah. now you have Even a bunch of mistake of the brainstorming process. Yeah, right? you have yeah. a bunch of men That's a good one. swimming in water. I like that. Uh, okay, well, next one is our current calls. Current I mean, if calls. I'm a recruit, I want to go there, right? No doubt. No, I mean, no, it seems apparently. like that's I think exactly the money. What... I think the money they're getting as a recruit. No. I couldn't even, I couldn't stop. Uh, our current calls are brought to you by our friends at Assured Partners. And? Me. Mm -hmm. um, what we got today, boys? You I, got, I got one. I'll lead it off. You know, it is the uh, Major League Baseball playoffs. So mm -hmm. I'm going to. I'm going to kick it over to the Major League Baseball playoffs. And then this, this is a little different. I'll call it a presumptive curtain call. In the age of analytics and fig, a figurehead at the manager position, if you will, and we'll run it from the office, mind you, here is the matchup in the ALCS. Two managers, both have managed for 26-plus years, Bruce. multiple pennants. They got World Series titles. Now, I'm not saying they're completely ignorant to nope. analytics and what's going on and what the front office may be trying to push, but I find it hard to believe that the front office is right in there. No doubt. lineups day in and day out and telling them how they should do it and somehow they've lasted and made and found their way to get teams to this point in the year where everyone's trying to go. I think that should be a lesson and sometimes it's always, you know, every sports leagues and success in America really is all about the copycat lead and hopefully 
one of these guys can get a chance to win. So somehow that can kind of push that process back into, hey, maybe we need somebody with a little feel down there with, with their feet on the ground that's seeing it every day. So hat off yep. to them, curtain call to them. They need more love because they've been doing unbelievable for a long time. I'm glad you said that because I was going to go along those same lines. So I'm not necessarily what those two guys are obviously the reason for this. So I'm going to jump on board with you. But, um, you know, like you said, you see analytics, they use the analytics, they use that information, but they also use their eyes. There's a happy medium. Uh, a lot of teams have taken their pitchers out before they get to the fifth, before they get to the fourth, you know, not even when they're in trouble, when they're pitching well, because they don't want them to go through the line because that's what analytics say. If you watched last night's game, you had Justin Verlander throw into the seventh and you had uh, Montgomery throw into the seventh, yeah. right? These guys saw what was going on. They saw what these pitchers were doing and they allowed them to continue to go until they felt like, okay, this is the reasonable time to take him out. Goes to your point. So curtain call, hat tip to Bruce Bochy and to uh, Dusty Baker for, you know, doing it the way that I think it's supposed to be done. Using the analytics, using the numbers, but also using your eyeballs and, and your experience. And before you kick it too, like they, we've gotten so far in analytics, and this, and this isn't just baseball, we've gotten so far in analytics to where now when big decisions are made, and people are asked questions about those big decisions, it's now, well, the analytics yeah, says we say? should do it. Right. And it's no longer, no one wants to take ownership of the decision that was made and put the onus on themselves. So we've gotten that far into it to where it's about time for us to scale that thing back a little. No doubt. Go Lord, ahead. you got one? Speaking of analytics. There is understanding yes, about football. Yes, yes, he, has, he pulls the fan out. And this is this is analytics right here, 101. He said, don't think you can't affect the game from the hole. You got it. You got it. I love that. I love this guy. We've all been there. I'm happy that he won his bet and his team won. No doubt. You think he gambled or no? No doubt. No he doubt. On the, on the right side and everything. What if he was on the other side? He'd be like, oh, whatever. No doubt. He always um, misses to the right. He pushes it. it. I love it. Great show today. Very What's fun? For y'all. We, we got through it. I'd say it's Mondays are a sprint. Uh, please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. I will be back live in studio from <laughs> 6 to 8 p.m. on Wednesday. If you can't watch us, you like listen to us. We're anywhere you get your pods. Again, we appreciate all love and support. We'll be back here on Wednesday. Enjoy the rest of your Monday. Enjoy Monday Night Football. Who do you Peace. got? Who do I got? I got, um, as much as I don't want to say it, I think I got the Cowboys. That's disgusting. I know. That's what I got. Chargers money line, Chargers under. Mm. Enjoy your day. Enjoy your night. Enjoy How, what's your stat line tonight? What's that line? I don't know. We're about to find out. Gotta go get there so I don't be late for my game. They need you. <laughs> Later.